Hi and welcome to revisionmedia.org with me, Paul Stevenson. I am with you live here for the next hour. That's 9 p.m. till 10 p.m. in London, the UK, where I am. 5 till 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. Welcome wherever you are around the world. And I am delighted to say I am live with uh, E. Michael Jones for the next hour here. Uh, Mike is the uh, editor of Culture Wars magazine. He is uh, a public speaker and uh, author of various different books, including uh, Libido Dominandi, uh, Baron Metal, The Slaughter of Cities, and The Jewish Revolutionary Spirit, which I'm um, very glad to say I have a signed copy of that uh, from Mike, so I'm grateful for that. Um, as I say, he's a, he's a prolific uh, uh, speaker on social media. In fact, I would say over the last year, his profile has has really exploded. And um, and that's great, too, because uh, he's very popular and uh, he's one of my favorite guests. And uh, generally, I think he's very much loved. Mike, are you with me? Yes. So, Good to be here. I think that, yeah, are you well? Yes. I did mention to you, it was quite funny, I did mention to you a little bit about the, the Brexit the, the thing over here. I mean, it's, uh, I, I, have you guys, do you, do you keep uh, keep an eye on that at all from America? I mean, I know you said you know, it's so confused and I'm confused by it as well. Everybody's confused by it. Do, do, you, do you monitor that at all and look across at that? Yes, every day there's a report on it and uh, there's some type of development uh, and it's so confusing that no one over here understands what's going on. The, the, yeah. the, all we know is that uh, Eng uh, Britain has been trying to re uh, uh, leave the European Union for a couple of years now, and they have not succeeded. Yeah, three and a half years to be precise. I voted in that, and like many, it was the first time I'd actually voted because you know it, it was a direct democratic um, operation, and you know the, the Parliament. I mean, it, it literally has been the greatest display of political press to digitation that I've ever seen. And I think the most, you know, they, they really are the most unprincipled, duplicitous, perfidious bunch in that parliament that I've seen in, in, in my lifetime. And if it's done anything, it's it's revealed that democracy is an illusion in this country. Well, we, we have the same conflict over here. It's called Donald Trump. Uh, and ba basically they're similar. They appeared in time and what you see, have what both have in common is uh, dissatisfaction among the average person with the oligarch's agenda. So they've decided that they don't like it, uh, that they would like a change. Uh, they registered this through the democratic process, which is supposed to be their right. And then as soon as they register, as soon as they succeed in doing this, then suddenly the oligarchs throw up all sorts of barriers to impede uh, the will of the people. And that's what we're seeing now. The latest manifestation of all this is this constant pressure now to, for hate speech legislation. Uh, it's both uh, in England, uh, I'm sorry, in the United States and Ireland, it's particularly acute. Uh, they want to censor the internet. They've already worked on that. And now they're trying to get in the United States laws placed on the books uh, to benefit the oligarchs. Uh, there's a specific group of oligarchs that is responsible primarily for it namely the, the Jews and their organizations. The ADL in the United States, the Anti-Defamation League, is the leader in, in the attempt to impose uh, hate speech uh, uh, censorship on the Internet. Uh, but it, it, it all comes down to the same thing. You have basically a group of people who no longer accept the dominant conventional narrative. They don't accept uh, business as usual. They're vocal in expressing this. And instead of accommodating their wishes, which is something that should happen in a democratic uh, uh, government, democratic country, they've decided to suppress the speech instead. Yeah, because they're desperate. Um, and it's very crude, but it is desperate. And I, I think I think they're a mad dog. We've spoken about this before. And, and they, they just keep pushing and keep pushing. And, and so they get a reaction. And eventually the consciousness changes. And as I say, whether we get Brexit or not, it really has woken a lot of people up because, because they, are, they are watching now and they see what is going on. They see the duplicity. They see the hypocrisy. And it's, not, it's no longer us conspiracy theorists on social media who are now saying 
democracy is an illusion and that we are ruled by a very small group of people. People are realizing now what's going on. Yeah, I just saw a mainstream article on pornography in uh, Ireland. It appeared in one of the mainstream uh, Irish papers. Uh, and it stated the case and sort of goes back and forth. And then the first comment is mentions me and libido dominandi, sexual liberation and political control as the best analysis of that. So once that happens, this what used to be the underground is now coming into the mainstream media. And that will disconstruct, dis deconstruct their narrative. I guarantee you that my book, Libido Dominandi, will take the conventional narrative about pornography, which has always been sold as a kind of freedom, and it will turn it upside down, and the reality will be that it's a kind of bondage. And that, so what, what you're seeing here is now that the message has been reversed. This is, this is a, in many ways, it's a form of asymmetrical warfare, what we're doing here. So it takes a lot of money to create an aircraft carrier. And you got to have a lot of ships around it. And you send it over to the other part of the world. And then some missile that costs a fraction of that sinks the aircraft carrier. Well, the same thing here with the media. It costs a lot of money to create mainstream media. It's a huge business. It's been building for decades now. And now you've got uh, a couple of ideas that get promoted outside of it, gradually creep onto it. And it sinks one of the main aircraft carriers of our culture. And I'm talking about pornography now. It was created as a form of control. It's always been a form of control. But as soon as you say it, it's like that missile or the, the drone that got into Saudi Arabia and blew up the, uh, the oil refinery. <laughs> that, and that's asymmetrical, but that's the way things work. And you have an idea. If the idea is powerful enough, it can sink an aircraft carrier. That's, that's what we're seeing now. Yeah, and I think that's kind of en encapsulated in uh, the existence and success of True News, which I saw you on. And I was very encouraged and comforted uh, to see you on there uh, on True News and to have that discussion because, I mean, th those guys are not, not are, are not just, you know, not avoiding the topic and not just discussing it, but th those guys are heading it head on. And they, they are aberrant, particularly in Western Protestantism, for discussing this issue. Right. That, uh, they're breaking ranks. Uh, I think Rick Wiles was a Zionist at some point or other, and then he woke up to realize that that's, that's not uh, a f defensible theological position. And so now you have a lot of people uh, waking up to the, these positions. And the result is the, the whole uh, superstructure is kind of shaking apart at this point. Now, yeah, I mean, that's a, they, they, uh, they, yeah. the question is, the question is, if you put it honestly to people, uh, is what I'm saying, is it really uh, a form of racism? Or are you just trying to sh use that? You're using this term to shut down a discussion you don't like. And I think what we're seeing, just what I've been reading in Ireland, on the blogs in Ireland, there's a, a, a Charlie Flanagan is trying to introduce hate, hate speech legislation in Ireland. And the people are now saying, no, no, it's, it's, this isn't hate speech. It's speech you don't like. You're just, you're just trying to ban speech you don't like. That's not what we're, this isn't about hate. This isn't about racism. It's about speech you don't like. Now, that, I think, that explanation is going to carry the day. I think because it's a lot more plausible than what they're trying to say. And, and in addition to that, you know, I've, I've had all, you're right. I did, I have gotten, my profile has gotten much larger over the last year on the internet. And the people uh, who don't like what I'm saying are now publishing articles about me because they used to just ignore me. It was, I, didn't, it was, it, I didn't have enough following. Now I've got enough following. They have to write articles about me and they have to attack me. Well, what are they going to say to attack me? Either they're going to tell the truth about what I said, in which case I say, yeah, I said that. What, I'm not going to apologize. I, I think it's my right to say this because my right is, I'm, talking, I'm saying it's a, religious, it's a religious issue and I have a right to talk about it. Mm. I think that eventually that will, that argument will win the day. 
I think that's what what we're, what's happening right now. It's hanging in the balance right now. Yeah, because in many ways they they win this war because they control the language, and and, and in many ways it is a linguistic war, right? and it's they, they, and they repeat it all the time, and they you know it, it, this anti-Semitic thing is just thrown out there, and everybody's terrified of it, the hate speech thing. I mean, I know. I mean, a couple of videos ago, was it you or me had the, the video deleted? Since then, they've done a complete hatchet job on my YouTube channel. They they they've just totally deleted, I think, about eight videos, interviews from my channel, you know, and so. Yeah, uh, and, and so uh, they can't accuse me of fomenting violence because every time I talk about this, I say uh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying that the antidote to violence is not suppression of speech. It's allowing speech. It's allowing people to air what they perceive as legitimate grievances. If you do not deny the people the right to air their legitimate grievances, you are the one who is promoting violence, not the people who want to talk. You're promoting violence by shutting people down. And I think that that's, that's borne out in a lot of these uh, shootings. Some of the shooters say, I, it's a time for talk is over. No one's listening. I have to act. That's the yeah, because, yeah, yeah, it causes a pressure cooker situation. And I actually think, I, if, if, personally, I think that's, that, that's my real sort of bet noir about this whole situation. It's not even necessarily what, what jury does or what's going on it's the fact that you you're it, it you're not allowed to talk about it i mean and you know western protestantism is particularly guilty of this and i think it's a great tragedy and i you know it, it's like it, it's as if we're saying that every every time every jew walking the earth is just evil incarnate and we're, we're not saying that but and but as an organized group you know british jury or international jury of course you know it, it's it, you know as we know from your interview with Dr. Brown and the criticism there. There's even all this hypersensitivity around the identification and the definitions we use, etc. You know, or using the term. I mean, yeah. Brown, Brown's point was that by the fact that I actually I use the term the Jews, that means I'm ipso facto an anti-Semite. Mm. So you can't use the term the Jews. Well, he uses it all the time. Mm. It's okay. It, it, so when he uses it and he says uh, the Jews got more Nobel Prizes than any other group in the world. Well, is that anti-Semitism? You're saying the word the Jews. Well, yeah. no, that's different. So it turns out that certain people are not allowed to make these statements, or you're not allowed to criticize a Jew. If, 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 if you want to define the current definition of anti-Semitism is basically criticism of Jews. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, no one is allowed to criticize the Jew. It's that simple. And in England, yeah. it's worse than it is over here as... as uh, De Jez Turner found out if you say something a Jew really doesn't like, he'll take you to court. He'll force the courts to say that it's hate speech, and then you, you get thrown in jail. That's not the situation over here, but they're trying to change that situation. All the big Only powers, of Jews, like the Lauder, the Lauder family, uh, are pressuring their organizations for hate crime legislation over here. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you know, you, you even see it with the likes of, you know, Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, they try to say that he's an anti-Semite because, because he's got some set sensitivities around, uh, you know, slaughtering Palestinians for fun, and that he he had the temerity to say to say that he didn't he didn't think that Jews get British humor. But I, you you will notice that you know racism, misogynist, all these words, you know, they still sort of inspire and create some fear and discomfort. But they're kind of largely losing their strength. But if you call someone an anti-Semite, I mean, wow, watch. People People like run for the hills and the, the, the terror that it creates in people is just staggering, you know? Yeah, but it's the only weapon they have. I mean, it, it's it's like a, a big gun, but it's only got one bullet in it. Yeah. So what happens if, What happens when they fire the bullet and it doesn't kill you? Well, what they don't have a second bullet to fire at you. That, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's the issue. And the very fact that they're promoting this and de promoting these laws and deplatforming these uh, people that they don't agree with is a sign that they're losing the argument. They don't have an argument. They can't argue. So they just have to shut you up. That's I, not I a think good situation to be in. No, it's not a very good situation to be in. I mean, I think one of my own uh, frustrations with it is because I, cause I've seen this. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm actually starting up a new YouTube channel. It's called Seek First, Seek First Ministries, as in Seek First the Kingdom. And, and I know from previous experience, if, if there are certain leading Protestant you know, guys that I might 
that are popular popular on on social media and, and have reasonable profiles that I might approach to interview, if they get wind that you know I that, that Jews against Jews, they're going to want to distance themselves from that. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, am I going to like seriously reduce? you know, the, the types of people and the, the range of discussion and topics I have on because of this issue. Do you, see the, do you see the frustration? Do you see the quandary? Because you're thinking that so many people are scared of it. They don't even want to be associated with it or even go near it, you know? Right. What's the point of having this great new medium of communication if you can't talk about things? What's the well, point of it? The only, the only point of it, the, the reason it got so big was because it was an alternative to all the speech codes that inhibit mainstream media and all of the uh, the uh, manipulation of information that goes on there. So then you're going to oppose the same thing here. Then what's the point of having it? It, it defeats itself. It defeats itself. Yeah, I think people, I just think genuinely people are scared. I think if they didn't have jobs and maybe children and they were, because obviously, you know, there are so many, there's so much influence and power in, in academia. Uh, uh, you know, the Jews yield in so many different ways that people are terrified that there may be loss of income or ostracization to be associated with, like, being anywhere near a, one of those evil anti-Semites. Um, and it, it is frustrating. I mean, it doesn't actually bother me personally if someone calls me an anti-Semite, but it does bother me when I when I suspect that someone might not want to come on my show because I've, you know, because I even, I mean, it's not it's not like I go around thinking about Jews all day, Mike, you know, it's just... It, it, it's something that needs to be and should be able to be discussed like everything else. Right. Right. You're absolutely right. Okay. Right. So you're, you're working on a new project. Um, tell us about that. Uh, this, this is, is, is it Logos Rising? Yes. Okay. The book, the book is finished. We're now editing it. So it should be out. We're hoping to get it to the printer uh, this, by, by the end of this month. So okay. the, the title is Logos Rising. The subtitle is, uh, a history of ultimate reality, uh, and it's about that uh, basically that that Greek word entering history and trying to explain man's relationship to what he perceives as ultimate reality. Is it God, or is it little balls bumping into each other called atoms? And the first conflict of the conflict uh, that usually is associated with it is the conflict between religion and science. And, and we, we grew up with this, uh, with uh, people like Bertrand Russell, for example, who made a living out of exploiting this kind of differential between religion and science. He would start off saying he's just going to talk about it, and then at the end it turns out that science trumps religion, and that Bertrand Russell is the man who's in pos the possession of ultimate reality, and so if we want to know what's going on, we have to listen to him. That's the short uh, version of this, of this story. Not that simple. All right. Okay. Well, listen. I, I'm just going to give you the floor. Just, just expand on it. You know, what, what, what the book's about. Why are you writing it, and what you hope to achieve? Um, we haven't got that long, so I'll, I'll just give you the floor. And as I say, you can just break it all down. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's about what we were just talking about, because the main manifestation of logos is the it's the Greek word for reason or word. It's also uh, discourse, it's speech. And that's what we're talking about. We, we are having a conversation here about issues. We are the only being in the universe that can sit down and talk about issues, abstract issues, and resolve these issues by uh, coming, by, by relying on reason. So it came, my, uh, I began the thinking about this because I've been traveling all over the world. And we're now in a position where you can come in contact with people all over the world. I did it in person in these travels, but now you have the internet and you can have conversations with people all over the world. So the, the question is, uh, can we have sophisticated conversations? Is there, uh, is there a way of coming to conclusions about certain crucial issues? And I'm saying there is. So it's a book about, it's optimistic about the possibilities of communication it's uh, an exploration of the rational structure of the universe and how people have grown in their uh, a more and more sophisticated understanding of the universe and the ultimate reality behind the universe. That's that's pretty much what it's about. And uh, specifically, um, from from what I know of talking to you and from what I know of it, 
this will be the embodiment of uh, Jesus Christ, the word that John talks about at the beginning of his gospel, correct? Well, I start off with, well, I start, actually, I started with the beginning of everything. Okay, like the cr creation. Okay, because this is, uh, because I was in uh, India. And, uh, the, uh, you know, we go to the Nehru Science Center in India, and the first, they have a, a picture, a picture, a mural of the, history of the universe and the beginning of it is atoms formed that doesn't make any sense you can't just say atoms formed what did they form from did they form from something else and if it was from something else then atoms weren't the first thing so what is how do, there's no coherent talk about beginnings here okay because a beginning is a very complicated uh, thought it requires sophisticated thought to understand a beginning or creation and for the most part people understood it intuitively and they had myth mythologies about it uh, they understood that there was a god that, and they, when they tried to figure it out they figured out what they, they knew he was kind of like a, a god the father was a term that they used uh, and then they got sidetracked thinking well if he's a father he must have a beard and so on and so forth and that took them down the, or into mythology which was a distraction, and the Greeks finally realized this is getting us nowhere. You have to have a better, more scientific understanding of it, and that was the beginning of uh, what you would call philosophy, which was pretty much materialistic in its orientation, and so it was pretty much indistinguishable from physics in the beginning. And people were saying, well, it's water, it's air, it's fire, and it's coming up with the uh, basically the, the problems when you make it that type of designation. Until finally they came up with something saying, well, it's not really material. And this was a huge breakthrough because then you started talking about abstract things like being. And, and Plato and Aristotle took this to its logical conclusion and they both understood that there was a God, but they couldn't agree on what the God was. So in order, God had to be transcended. He had to be able to create everything out of nothing without being affected by itself. So that's clear. But then does that God care about you? And if he doesn't, why should I care about him? And so Plato yeah, had a God that cared about you and Aristotle had a God that was completely transcendent. And that just stalled at that point. Philosophy could not resolve that issue. The only way it got resolved was through revelation when Jesus yeah. Christ basically came down and changed the course of human history. And when, when John decided, so, so they're, they have a commission now, these people who follow Jesus Christ, to tell other people about what they believe. And in the beginning, it was easy because you pretty much told the Jews that this was the Messiah you've been waiting for. But then the Jews expelled all these people from the synagogue, people like Paul, and he had to talk to Greeks. Well, these Greeks don't know your story about the Messiah. They don't know who these people are. They never heard of Moses or any of these people. So how do you explain it to them? Well, John did it by referring to Greek philosophy. And so the first three sentences of his gospel are in the beginning there was logos and logos was with god and logos was god so now you're situating this story in in the ter terminology of greek philosophy and that solves greek philosophy's problem and now you have kind of a universal language that you can use a universal philosophical language that you can use uh, to talk to everyone in the world yeah i'd like, like you know, you know yeah, the, the, the Greeks did have a, a concept of, of Logos, and, and, and that was a kind of, you know, that was a good starting point for, for Paul. And, I, and I, I, I think that, you know, John's Gospel addressed some of the um, issues around, um, you know, the, the Greeks and their philosophies and stuff. But it was, it, 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 was, it, it did help them to say, listen, you, you've got this concept of Logos. Well, you just need to shift you over here and, and let's look at this figure of Jesus Christ because this is the Logos. Yeah, that, that was a big breakthrough. Yeah. The Logos is a person. Well, that's yeah. real. I, I mean, I thought it was air. For a while, we thought it was air or water or a, a form uh, in Plato's term. And then finally, it's an unmoved mover. But is it a person? Well, yeah. And, and, and it's a person that's not only completely transcendent, it's a person that became a human being. So it resolves that problem. So it took, uh, it, it was, this was, I, I think I, I say in my book, I think that Paul failed uh, to do this. Uh, and I'm basing that on the story of the Areopagus, where he tried to tell them that Jesus Christ was this man who rose from the dead before he actually told them what what it was, what he was. 
And they said, yeah, that's that's a great story. We'll talk about that later. And they all walked out, except for two people. And I think John knew about this because John and Paul were both hanging out in Ephesus at the time. I think John knew about this failure. And he said, well, we have to have a different approach here. And that's why he chose Logos, because it would allow him to talk to a Greek audience. The language, they were writing in Greek, it was, it, it, but it was also making use of Greek concepts. It's more than just the language. It's the concepts behind the language. And yeah. that, that's what made the difference. And that's what I'm trying to articulate here. It's more than just, the, okay, we all speak uh, English. That's great. Okay, it was, you know, the, the British Empire, the American Empire, they were, you could argue they were bad things uh, for some people anyway, but uh, it spread English, the English language all throughout the world. And now we have a language where we can speak to people all over the world, but we need to, to have a, a sophisticated philosophy behind that language to allow us to talk about things that are important rather than just mm. commercial transactions. And that's why I'm writing this book, because I think we need to have this conversation because as I said, I, I, I don't know where I said this before on your program, but I was in India and uh, it's a Catholic school, but 80% of the students are Hindus. Uh, and they, they know there's something more than what they're getting. It's, it's more than something of like, there's something more than just Hanuman, the monkey God and the Nehru Science Center. There's got to be something in between because these things don't link up at all. So he asked me if I could prove the existence of God. 16-year-old boy asked me that. That's that's a question that in many ways the entire world is asking. Yeah. And the, the question is really, is there some connection between science and religion? And I'm saying, yeah, there's a middle term. It's called logos. And both of them come out of that. And they are ultimately compatible if you trace it back to that. But not if you're Bertrand Russell. Because yeah. Bertrand Russell decided he was going to make a living by beating up Christians. His most famous speech is why I am not a Christian, if you remember that. It's a speech he gave in the 1920s in England. And so his I, job was basically to convert the world to the Anglo-American religion, which is known as science. And I'm saying it's a religion because it's ultimate reality. He, he is, the, he is the, the, uh, the gatekeeper for ultimate reality. So if you say, well, I believe in God, well, you have to run that by Bertrand. You run, run that by Bertie first, okay? And Bertie will tell you whether it's a, a legitimate statement or not because he's the gatekeeper for ultimate reality. This was the situation in the Anglo-speaking world. Uh, and in many ways, it still is. If, if you go to people like Richard Dawkins and, and Sam Harris and the late Christopher Hitchens, I mean, you can't get away with saying there's a God or something like that. They, they're going to say, no, that's not true. It's a myth. It's a fiction. And I know that because I've studied Charles Darwin. Well, this is preposterous. And, and the next chapter is about, it's about Dawkins and Darwinism and how they cannot explain how anything can come into existence. That's the incoherence of Darwinism. You know, the, the Greeks back in the day, sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I was just going to say that the culmination of this idiocy is Sam Harris, the only philosopher among the group of the four new atheists. It was the kind of the dance craze about 10 years ago. Sam Harris said, the universe created itself out of nothing or something very small. Now, that has got to be the most idiotic statement in the history of philosophy. That is, that is incredibly stupid to make that statement. Now, why do I say that? Who am I? Well, first of all, the universe cannot create itself because if it did, it would have to exist before it existed. Well, no, that's impossible. So we'll rule that out. And well, what about from something very small? Well, if it's already something very small, it exists. So therefore, you've already got something existing. So it's it's already you're 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 just you're just saying the same thing twice. It's a circular argument. This is the type of argument that people took seriously, uh, and, and it, it's all this appeal to science as the ultimate reality, uh, and you're not supposed to object. Uh, you're just supposed to go along with fundamentally irrational statements 
So it's across the board. You've got someone like Christopher Hitchens, who's not a scientist. He's not a philosopher. He's a journalist. But he's a, 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 a confirmed believer in Darwinism. And so he says, uh, when it comes to the eye, well, it evolved from light-sensitive cells. Well, wait a minute, Christopher. Either the light-sensitive cells can see, cells can see, in which case they are already an eye, or they can't see, in which case they can't become an eye. This is just simple philosophical reasoning applied to this preposterous uh, uh, claim uh, that these people somehow ultim re represent ultimate reality. Yeah, I mean, it's more based on hubris. I mean, these people, you know, people like Dawkins embarrass himself because his hubris, you know, I mean, if, you know, far outweighs uh, any brilliance the man has, you know, I mean, the guy's a biologist, or, I mean, and yet he, 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 he argues, you know, as if he's, as if he's like a, a, a theologian. Uh, well, by, by, uh, he's, uh, he's basically making a metaphysical argument based on biology. Well, you can't do that. OK, you can't you may have a very fast car, but it's not an airplane. It's not a boat. It's different. And you can't get to talk about metaphysical things through biology. But that's precisely what Darwinism. That's what Darwinism purports to do. And that's why it mm. fails, because they cannot get from nothing to something. They can't do it. It's impossible. That which is no. cannot come from that which is not. So you can never come to an I from a non-I. It's impossible. It can't happen, and they can't explain it, and that's the fundamental flaw of their argument. Yeah, I mean, even Darwin himself, I mean, I, I, he said in his book, he said, the greatest threat to my theory is that if it were true, you would expect to see everywhere uh, in the fossil record um, the intermediary species. The, the, the complete lack of such evidence is the biggest threat to my theory. But you don't hear that being talked about because the media and the, the, the I think, satanic forces of the world have pushed this idea progressively that um, it, it's, it just gets established as if it's fact. And their main arguments are basically mass consensus and ridicule. I remember, I remember literally going to a pub in Belfast in 2012, and I said I didn't believe in evolution. For an hour, the guys thought I was joking. When they realized it was actually serious, the, the, I mean, these people got incredibly aggressive and insulting, you know? Yeah. Yeah, there's the story about the, the man coming home from <clears throat> the pub in Belfast, and he's had a little too much to drink, and uh, he gets accosted by this group. And it's dark out, and uh, he can't tell whether it's the uh, Royal Ulster Constabulary or the IRA. So they ask him, are you a Protestant or a Catholic? And so he says to them, I'm an atheist. And then they say, are you a Catholic atheist or a Protestant atheist? <laughs> well, uh, Christopher Hitchens is a Protestant atheist. <laughs> Yeah, anyway. exactly. Well, he was anyway. I mean, talking about religion, uh, you know, I mean, you, you, you were talking about, you know, the Indian thing. I mean, I, I think it's a great tragedy that we have so much of the kind of new age, kind of esoteric so-called wisdom in, in, in the church today by professions. And it, it, it pains me because we used to, you know, and we still do, but, you know, take the gospel out to these nations who are in darkness and, and give them the gospel. And, and now what we have is we have Christians in this land who never seem to embrace Christian truths. And they might go to church on a Sunday, but the rest of their the, the, their lives are led by esoteric philosophies and secular psychotherapeutic philosophies. Uh, you know, it, I find it, you know, tragic, yeah. really, you know. It, why? But why is this? Because the Christians have been convinced that or to that they are allowed to say, well, I believe in this because it makes me feel good, but it's not reality. Uh, yeah. Science is reality. Uh, my religion is not reality. I'm just it's just a subjective thing. It's a matter of taste. I'm just holding on to it because it makes me feel good. Or I once think I won't go to hell. Once that, once you accept that dichotomy, you you have no right to to, to uh, 
allow your religion to have any influence on public policy. And this is all this is the way they've been using this to basically destroy the moral order, because religion is the main guardian of the moral order. Christianity in, is the main guardian of the moral order. If you attack Christianity, you undermine the moral order. If you undermine the moral order, you're removing the protections that people have against the rich and the powerful. It's really the only protection we have. And they are using this to basically control people. And of course, the, the, the cutting edge of this is sexual liberation, because people have these sexual desires. They know they're immoral if they act on them. But here's the government going along, giving them what looks like a license to engage in this behavior. And so you create whole identity groups like homosexuals now. Homosexuals are now the proxy warriors of the oligarchs because uh, they have been given permission to act on their desires. And in return for that, uh, they become the servants of the people who control uh, the culture. That's, that's what's happening here. But the other uh, point here is that we're all waking up to that. We're all waking up to that fact, and it doesn't work when suddenly you wake up to it. And if uh, if you oppose it, um, you're evil because you know cultural Marxism or political correctness is a religion of itself. It has all the doctrines of you know insane sort of egalitarianism and uh, you know incl inclusivity and you know. Uh, no tolerance for racism and if you step outside of that you get the uh you know the, the, the if they could they would uh, burn you at the stake instead you just get ostracized you might lose jobs you might lose friends etc etc but it is a moral crusade for these people and ups down and downs up i mean isaiah said woe to those who call good evil and evil good because if you criticize this sort of stuff you are evil you're out of step i mean again it's back to the language they use the word progressive to, to sort of encapsulate these type of things. So the more degenerate we get and the more we affirm homosexuality and the more, in quotes, freedom we have, this is called progress, apparently. Well, it also has to do with identity groups or, or if you want to say identity politics. Yeah. So they will create privileged groups. The homosexual is a privileged group. Hmm. Okay. They have been granted privilege uh, by the oligarchs but what that identity then becomes a prison for the people who sign up for it. Okay. So these privileged groups can then uh, do certain things that other people are not allowed to do. You're allowed to choose uh, membership in a privileged group, but it's not just that. Okay. So for example, one of the groups that got privileged, one of the categories that got privileged over here over the course of the second half of the 20th century was race. Now, we, we've we've looked into this. The socio sociologist at this time uh, came up with a theory called the triple melting pot, which said basically uh, that ethnicity in America was dependent on religion. After three generations, the people who came here basically lost their language, but they retained ethnic identity through their religion. This is a book that came out in 1954. It was called Protestant Catholic Jew. It was written by a Jew by the name of uh, Will Herbert. And it, I, I think it gave an accurate description of the uh, ethnic identity in America. But 1954 is the same year in which the Supreme Court handed down its um, Brown versus School Board decision, which ended uh, desegregation. And that suddenly changed the category to race. So now the government is saying, well, religion is not important, race is important. So what they're trying to do is to tell you, you should identify according to your race. Now, the black people at this point realize, well, this is a good idea, because now if we identify with as black, we have the government on our side. And the government will give us certain benefits because we are doing the bidding of the government. In other words, we're, we're co contributing to the racial uh, polarization of the country, we're allowing the government to, to use race as an excuse to step in and interfere with behavior that was off limits before when it was considered religious behavior. Uh, and uh, this is good. Well, the other problem here is that when you create one group, uh, you also create the other group, which is its opposite. And that is precisely white. So now people started, I, because the blacks were having 
privilege, the whites started to identify as the unprivileged group. And this happened uh, more recently, but now you have uh, another identity that's rising up uh, because at the same time this is happening, you're, you're, having, you're encouraging the secularization of the culture, you're de-emphasizing religion, which is the source of people's real identity, and you're creating a pseudo-religion. Now, at a certain point, people will identify with this, these categories, uh, largely because they've been pushed into it and they don't understand what they're doing. And I'm in a big argument right now with people who are claiming that they're white. I'm saying, no, wait a minute. You should think this through. You should think this through because by identifying yourself as white, when what you really are is a Protestant, a Catholic, or a Jew, you are playing into the hands of your enemies. And so I, I did just did a review of a, a posthumous book by Sam Francis, the conservative thinker that just came out. Uh, the book just came out. Sam died about 10 years ago. And I'm saying Sam embodied this. He, he's a Southerner, okay? He was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'm sure he was baptized, okay? But religion disappeared from this guy's life early on. So he needed another identity. So he became a conservative. And then conservative is okay for a while. And then basically he gets expelled from the synagogue of conservatism. And he starts identifying as white. Now, the irony here is that he converted to Catholicism on his deathbed which caused huge uproar when I mentioned this at the Sam Francis Memorial. But the problem here is he got lots of other people to identify as white as well. Okay. And so they identify as white. One of them is Richard Spencer. Uh, Richard Spencer was one of the publishers of this book. Richard Spencer then goes yeah. and mobilizes these people as white uh, with the help of the media, the mainstream media who you think would be antagonistic to this idea. Well, they're not, because they want someone who will be a spokesman, who will identify this group as the demonized group that they want it to be. And Richard Spencer filled that bill, and so he became the leader of this group. He led the group to Charlottesville, and they felt that they had rights as Americans, and they were just mowed down, okay? It was a disaster. The state- It was the a disaster. City, it, the, the city turned on these people. Now, why did they turn on them? Well, because they're white. If you identify as white, you're saying you're a racist. And if you're saying you're a racist, you have no rights. And so they were slaughtered. They were just mowed down. I mean, I've, uh, Richard Spencer handed out spears to the white guys, and they charged the machine gun nest, and they all got mowed down. Surprise. Well, you didn't know that was going to happen? No, you didn't. So just as some variation, uh, to, to give you some indication of the opposite of this, I'm in Dearborn uh, uh, a couple weeks ago. Michigan. Dearborn, Michigan. Where and look, uh, Henry Ford wrote his book. Right. Uh, Henry Ford, Ford Motor Company. Okay. There's an Arbaeen march in Michigan, Dearborn, Michigan. The Arbaeen March is the biggest gathering of human beings on the face of the earth. I think it's larger than the meeting in Mecca, the hit, the what I'm slipping, what forgetting what they call it. I think it's bigger than that. Anyway, millions of people get together and they march from uh, Najaf to Karbala, where they mourn the death of Hussein ibn Ali, okay, the grandson of the prophet. Okay, now. I show up there, it is, it looks like the advertisement for Arab terrorism. Okay, the, <laughs> these are, first of all, it's all of these people, they're all wearing their, their black, the women have their hijabs, uh, and the men have uh, headbands with, in green with Arabic writing on them. And we all start marching to Henry Ford Park, actually, which is where the rally was. Now. Did Antifa show up? Well, no. <laughs> no, they're not going to show up. Why, are, why is Antifa not going to show up at the Arbaeen march? Okay, number one, there are a lot of people, thousands and thousands of people here. So it's a big, strong march, and they would, they would just be taking their life in their hands if they attacked this group of people. But secondly, that's not the main reason. Secondly, this march 
has the right to take place because this is a religious group and religious groups have the right to assemble in the United States of America and white groups do not. It's simply a fact of life. And so you, because religious groups have identity and white groups do not have identity. And that's why this succeeded and why Charlottesville failed. And that's a lesson we all have to take to heart here because it's a fundamental fact of American life. Yeah, I mean, I have some, you know, I, I, you know, I consider myself to be a white male, um, but I don't, it's not my core identity. My core identity is, is as a Christian. And I look around at, you know. At, That's at right. The old, That's an important uh, you know. distinction, because if you ask someone, who are you? The simplest way to ask that, answer that question or the other way to answer that question is by saying, who made me? Because yeah. I am who I am because someone made me that way. I am male. I am female. That's not uh, that I was created that way. I don't have any choice in the matter. People will tell you that they do have choice in the matter, but it's not true. So the question is, you know, I happen to be right handed. So what? If you ask me who I am, do I say I'm a right handed guy? Uh, usually it's, it's not significant. It's true, but it's not significant. The government could divide up the entire population of the United States of America into right-handed and left-handed people, but they don't uh, because it's insignificant. Well, race is the same thing. It's their category. The only difference is they're saying that race is important and being right-handed or left-handed is not. And now there are people who, there are people, as I said, who benefited from this, First of all, it was the black people. Then there are people who are offended by it, the, the white people. And then they identify with the commands of their oppressors. And then they're shocked when they get when they get mowed down in Charlottesville. Yeah, I mean, do you, by the way, from, from what you were, you were talking about, Richard Spencer there and the background, from what you've said and, and where you're coming at this from, do you think he's more in the useful idiot category or do you think he's actually, you know, more sinister than that? Do you think he's de deliberately uh, been put there? Well, I was I, I wasn't at Charlottesville, but I know someone who was there and he said that the police confronted the people and gave them an ultimatum. Richard Spencer was there in front of the whole operation and uh, Richard Spencer walked away and everyone else got arrested well why is yeah, that I, yeah i i find the guy you know rather obnoxious i also find him a little bit effeminate did he strike you as that a little bit effeminate no but i mean that's the, the point the, the bigger point i'm trying to make is who appointed richard spencer the leader of the white guys and the answer to that is very simple it was mainstream media they chose him as the spokesman. They are the one who appointed him the leader. Now, that's because white is a completely empty category that they can control completely by simply naming the people who are in charge of it. Now, yeah, they if, can control if I that. Say, yeah. look, if I say I'm a Catholic and then they say, well, we're going to appoint your leader. I mean, they will try to do this. There's no question about it. They will appoint a spokesman. But I can say, well, no. The leader is the Pope in Rome or the leader is the bishop in my diocese. And there's an objective structure that I can refer to that has objective rules. Now, I'm saying this, this is significant because when I uh, became famous, uh, the people came out of the woodwork attacking me. And one of these guys was a guy by the name of Dexter Van Zyl, who writes for a Jewish uh, front propaganda operation called Camera. And somebody yanked his chain. And so his job is to destroy me. So it goes nowhere. And so he's going to take it to the next level. So what he does is writes a, a letter to my bishop, the bishop of my diocese, and says, this E. Michael Jones is a terrible person. You need to do something about this. Well, wait a minute. Like what? Like excommunicate me because somebody who's working for this Jewish operation doesn't like me? So it goes nowhere. He, the bishop doesn't answer his letter because there are certain criteria for getting expelled from the Catholic Church and uh, having uh, some Jewish organization not liking what you say is not one of those criteria. So nothing happened. So then uh, we get into, back into the realm of reality. Uh, the diocese is going to have a celebration for people who have been married 50 years, which I have been for this, this past summer. So I get invited. 
And then we get our picture taken with the bishop. And then I post it on the website. I'm saying this is the <laughs> difference between a real category, which is religious identity in America, and a phony category, namely being white. The, the, the media appoint your leaders when you're white and God appoints your leaders when you're a Catholic. Another uh, another trend I've noticed as well, because man is a religious creature, uh, you know, even for those who are identifying, uh, in, uh, you know, as white uh, as their core identity, they're also being religious because they've a lot of them have returned to neo-paganism and, uh, you know, Odin and these sorts of things. I mean, you know, That's so they're, the they are. This is, yeah. this is a serious problem right now in Sweden, for example. And over okay. here as well. And, and England, you have the Beltane celebration and Ireland. Okay, Ireland's the exception yeah, because yeah. Ireland was not a Protestant country. It was ruled by a Protestant country. Okay, but you have a place like England or Sweden where you had uh, a pro the Protestant Reformation that created a state church and that state church ruled the country uh, for 500 years and then suddenly they ran out of gas. And so in 2000, the year 2000, the Swedish Lutheran Church was disestablished. Okay, as soon as the Swedish, all right, the Swedish Lutheran Church was not as good as the Catholic Church, in my humble opinion, okay? But it did give a kind of more of an identity than what followed it, which is namely socialism. Socialism is the successor to Lutheranism as the state religion in Sweden, okay? That's even worse, and that creates a vacuum, and now the people are trying to fill that vacuum with paganism. Yeah, you, you see a lot of it. And um, I mean, I forget, who was it I was on with? It was actually uh, on the network here, the, the, the guy who runs the network, I, he interviewed me um, on the previous network and I got really heavily attacked on there by, by neo-pagans. And they said that, you know, uh, Europe isn't a Christian, isn't a Christian nation. We're a, we're a neo or we're a, we're, sorry, we're a pagan nation uh, or a pagan continent and stuff like that. And it's just like they're going back 2000 years right. to go back into darkness, you know? Right. And I'm saying, you guys, be careful what you pray for, or better still, be careful who you pray for. Because what you're going to do is you're going to pick up a spear and you're going to start chanting Thor's name and you're going to charge right into the machine gun nest and you're going to get mowed down the same way the white boys got mowed down in Charlottesville. Is there anything you want to add to just to conclude things? I mean, where when's your book going to be out and where, where can people get it? Give, give us go that to, information. Go to culturewars.com and log on and put your name there to order an advanced copy of Logos Rising. We're taking orders right now. The book should be out at the at the beginning of next year. Okay, well, I'll be, I'll be fascinated to read that. I'll, I'll send you over something and maybe you can send me a copy of it. Yeah, I'd be happy to discuss it with you when it comes out. All right, wonderful. Okay, Mike, it was, it was a pleasure as always speaking to you and um, we'll, we'll hopefully do it again soon when the book comes out. Thank you. Good talking to you. Yeah, you too. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Fascinating uh, as ever speaking to Mike and I hope you all enjoyed that. For any of you here on Revision Media that you're uh, new to, to E. Michael Jones, as I say, you can you can find find out what he's about at Culture Wars magazine, culturewars.com. I've got a su subscription to that. And you'll 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 find everything you need on there, his books uh, listed, etc., including Dominand, uh, Libido Dominandi, Barn Metal, Slaughter of Cities, The Jewish Revolutionary Spirit. He's a prolific writer. And he's a great guy. Everyone loves him. He's got about 50,000 YouTube subscribers now as well. And you can subscribe to his YouTube channel as well, of course. If you want to subscribe to my channel, it's uh, Paul Stevenson, S-T-E-V-E-N-S-O-N. I will put up a copy of, of the interview on my YouTube channel, and I'll also send it to Mike, which is tradition with me and Mike. I've, I actually interviewed Mike at, at way back in 2016 because his popularity you know, is what it is at the minute. So I've, you know, I've known him a little while now and it, 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 it's always fascinating talking to him. And as I say, he's, he's a gentleman and he's, um, he's very gracious and just a wealth of knowledge. So Culture Wars magazine, you can get everything you need there. Again, my YouTube channel is Paul Stevenson. If you want to donate to the work I do, you can do that on PayPal, Stevenson underscore P5 at sky.com. 
it's all appreciated and do uh, do donate to revision media as well as we continue here to expand the operation and continue to get to get great guests like mike on in the future that uh, revisionmedia.org uh you can go to the web page there and do be generous i mean we we are you know dedicated to truth we might not always get it right but we will allow people to speak we we're, we're dedicated to free speech and you know we're up against 24 hour mainstream propaganda network um so do support us as i say it's revisionmedia.org and uh, you, you can go to the home page and donate there and uh, thank you for tuning in and uh, i will be back here again next uh, thursday same time at 10, 10 till 11 p.m uk time here in london um that's was it five till six p.m Eastern Standard Time. So until then, I wish you all the best and God bless.